My name is Nick. Happy Father's Day. I know it's not that exciting. I get it. Um, <clears throat> uh, I live it out every year. Uh, it was funny because I was talking to Charlie this last week, and he said, because last time I was up here was actually Mother's Day, and so now I'm here for Father's Day, which is interesting because typically Mother's Day is one of the most highly attended services like around the country because like moms are like, we're going to church. And then on Father's Day, fathers are like, we're not going. <laughs> it's not happening. So Father's Day is one of the least attended. So hey, if you're a dad in this room right now, you should feel like an extra super Christian because you actually showed up, <laughs> which is pretty impressive. So good for you. Good for you. Uh, I'm the youth pastor here. Did you know those things still exist? We still do it. We still, we still minister directly to students, and it's good. If you are sitting there thinking, so he just hangs out with teenagers all day, every day, you're only half right, because it's not every day. But I do think about him, and I am praying about him all the time. It's basically all I think about uh, is teenagers. And so if you're sitting there thinking, man, I'd like to do that too, we're looking for small group leaders. We need them. We need middle school small group leaders. And so if you're one of those people, like one of the 0.001% on the planet that thinks I'd love to hang out with middle school boys, please come and talk to me. I think we might be best friends. Um, so <laughs> you, you, you see the quote up there, right? Not all who wander are lost. Quick quiz. Who knows what that's from? Just shout it out. Correct. So if you've heard me preach before, I'd say about 60% of the time I make a Lord of the Rings reference. Sometimes it's on purpose. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just draws me out of me. It's not my fault. Uh, and so when Charlie told me that's what they were going to, like, that's the subtitle of this series, I really feel like he was baiting me to do something Lord of the Ringsy with it. And I told myself, I'm not going to take the bait. And then I decided to just bring my book with me. Um, so... <laughs> This is actually a first edition collection. When they first put it, I'm just kidding, I got it from Barnes & Noble. Um, <laughs> so I actually remembered the quotes, and I'm going to be a huge nerd, and I'm just going to read it to you, because that's who I am. It's just my life. Um, so this is actually from Fellowship of the Ring, which is the first of the books, and it is a letter from our good friend Mr. Gandalf, who is a wizard, and I'm not going to go too deep into that, even though it's really awesome. Uh, so this is him, this is what he says. He says, and there's another fancy, like, fancy, fancy quote in here that a lot of people think is scripture. This is another one of those. A lot of people think this is scripture. It ain't. It comes from this book right here. He says, all that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken, the crownless again shall be king. This literally has nothing to do with my sermon. I will not be referencing this. Like, you know how pastors like to say something at the top and then talk about it at the end? I'm not going to do that. I'm just a super nerd, and he baited me, and so I had to do it. Read this book. It's good. Oh, I forgot. I also have a mug that says, not all who wander are lost. I got this way before they named the sermon. I just have it because that's who I am. This is me. You know, I am chosen. I'm not forsaken. I'm also a Lord of the Rings nerd, and I fully embrace it. Cold coffee is gross. Okay. Now we're going to start the sermon. Here we go. I love Disney World. I really, really, really like it. Well, I don't know. I like the concept of it. In practice, it's awful. I have, I've been so many times. I was so lucky. My sister worked there. She was a character. So if you went to Disney World in Orlando from the years like 2000 to 2010, and you saw Mike Wazowski character or Wendy or one of the dwarves, might have been my sister, uh, which is not interesting. Um, but so, we, so because she worked there, we would get to go free. So sometimes we would just be like, I don't know, what do you want to do Sunday afternoon? I don't know, let's go to Disney World. So we would go, and it was awesome. Uh, and so we've taken our kids a couple times, a few times as babies, uh, to which I always said, why are we doing this? They're not going to remember it, um, but I don't get to make those decisions. Um, 
it's true. Uh, but the last time we went, the last time we went, I don't know, it was a few years ago, and all of the kids were of the age to enjoy it. So it was, it was kind of like this thing we'd always dreamed about doing, taking our kids to this magical place in a season of life where they will actually build some memories and remember it, and we can take pictures with them, and it'll be so cute, and it'll be so fun. And of course, the only time we can do this is in August. Yeah. Uh, Texas is hot, no doubt about it. Florida is like the heat wraps you up in a wet blanket of hot water. It's, it's terrible. And you go to Disney World, and it, you're just losing all of the liquid inside of you just is gone within five minutes, and you're still supposed to enjoy it. And somehow we still do. But so this particular time, we had actually spent some money to go, which sort of broke my heart a little bit because it's not cheap, and I didn't like that. Uh, before we'd always gone, it was very casual, like, I don't know, we'll get the stuff. We're, we're here for free. What's the difference? But this time there was a little skin in the game, and so I was of the mindset that we better really, really, really like this. This better be as good as the commercials make it seem because I don't know if we're going to make rent next week. Um, <laughs> So we're in line, and it's already stressful, right? It's already blazing hot. It's like 9 in the morning, and it's already frustrating because I've already plunked down like $40 for parking. Um, and then I've got my kids, and they're tired already, and they're, they're, you know, we're ready to go in. And my oldest daughter, Kate, just starts to break down, like crying and crying and throwing little fits and has no interest and going into this place, which I purely, truly don't understand. To this day, it boggles my mind. We're trying to take her to the most magical place there is, which is literally built for her. 100% built around making sure that a, I don't know what she was, maybe eight-year-old, has the best day of her life, and she does not want to go. So much so that she is crying and pushing things and doing everything she can to not go into this promised land of magical, wonderful fun. And I was angry about that. Very angry, in fact. So much so that I was willing to say to her, I will sit with you in the car all day if you keep doing this. That was my, my big threat, which I... I don't know, maybe I should have just done that. Um, she, it, it make, I'm, I'm getting a little bit worked up right now just thinking about it. Um, she was not into it. And eventually, we dragged her into the greatest place on the planet, and she had the best time ever and loved it. And I just wanted to keep looking at her all day and say, I told you. I told you. I told you. I wanted to, like, tap her on the shoulder while we're going down Space Mountain and she's having a great time and be like, what I say? <laughs> she was looking at things from the physical perspective of it's too hot, it's too scary, it's too whatever, and she just did not want to do it. She couldn't see past the moment. It seemed impossible that she would have a good time. So today, we're going to read the stories in Numbers 13. And before we get into the actual story, I want this question to kind of blanket our discussion, blanket this story. I want you to think about this question as we're looking at this. What if we let God's promises, rather than our preferences, shape the decisions we make? Let me say it again. What if we let God's promises, rather than our preferences, shape the decisions we make today? Numbers 13 is the story. And if you know this story, then bravo to you. If you don't, great for me because I get to tell it to you. Uh, where jo uh, Moses sends the 12 spies into the land of Canaan to spy it out to see if it's ready for them to go in. All right? And the reason they're doing this is because God has been promising this to them for centuries, for hundreds of years. God has been saying, I will give you a land for your own. I will give you this land. And he promises it to Abraham. He promises it to his son Isaac. He promises it to his son Jacob. 
Three generations, he keeps delivering the same promise. I will bless those who bless you. This is to Abraham. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. I will make of you a great nation. I will make your name great. To Isaac, he says, I will give all of these lands to you. I will establish the oath I swore to Abraham, your father. In your offspring, all of the nations shall be blessed. Promise after promise. And to Jacob, he reminds him who he is. He says, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, and your father, Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, promise on promise on promise that I'm going to do this. This land that you're living in now will eventually be filled with people who look a lot like you. It will be your family that owns and, and lives and dwells and is making this land what it was meant to be. And so finally, Joseph, the son of Jacob, brings everyone into Egypt. That in itself is a very long story that I have just glossed over. It's okay. You can read the Bible. It's in there. Joseph brings everyone to Egypt, and they live there for centuries, about 400 years plus. They finally are living in in Egypt by themselves, and they're growing and growing and growing and growing. And this is not their land, and they know that because they've been given promise after promise after promise. And then things fall apart. They're enslaved. They're oppressed. They cry out, and God says, all right, let's go. And he brings this guy Moses into the picture, and he promises to Moses, you're going to have this very difficult job. It is not going to be easy, but whatever you do and wherever you go, I will go with you. That is a new promise. That is a new one. Wherever you go, whatever you do, no matter how hard it is, no matter how dangerous it is, I will go with you. And so they leave. They're rescued out of Egypt, and not in just a boring way, but in the most spectacular and divine way possible, where God systematically breaks down the connection these Israelites would have had to every single Egyptian deity that there was. Through every one of those plagues, he is showing you how this God isn't real, this God isn't real, this God isn't real. I'm the one. I'm the one. I am the one. And then he locks that down by breaking the ocean apart and bringing them through on dry ground, not even with muddy feet, and says to them over and over again, I am with you. I am here for you. You will be given this land. I promise you. He gives them a law that helps them to live in that land so that they can be in union with each other. They can be in community with each other, and they can live the way God intended them. And now, here in Numbers 13, they are right there ready to go. They're on the precipice of living into the fulfilled promise of God. The God of their fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the one that he promised over and over and over again. We're going to go into this land. It will be yours. You will be blessings to the nations. They're ready. It's time. Let's go. Before they go, because they're smart, they send some people into the land to check it out, all right? Uh, they go in, and in 13, this is the beginning of our passage, verses 1 through 3, it says this. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the command of the Lord. All of the men were heads of the people of Israel. So we can take a couple things from this passage. One, we see where they are. They're on the southern end of their land that they are going to possess. They're right there at the bottom. And so God sends these spies, and they go up through the whole thing. They go check it out. They spend 40 days there. And we know that this, these men were the chiefs among their tribe. Chiefs among their tribe. Their ages, who knows? Caleb, who we'll hear about in a minute, was 40. Joshua, who becomes... The leader of the Israelites after Moses was only 20. But these are men who have been selected as leaders to go in and check things out. The ones that we can trust. The ones that we can trust. I remember we visited um, Rome one time when I was a kid. And we got there to the Colosseum a little bit too late, which was a real bummer because we all really wanted to go. And we had scheduled it as the last day. And something happened, I don't remember. And we figured, well, I mean, we got to get in there somehow. So we took my youngest sister, who was probably about this tall at the time, gave her a camera and slid her through the bars and pushed her (laughs) and said, go check it out for us. Go go see if it's good. And so she she went in and took pictures and was terrified and came back, and everything's fine. 
We sent some spies into the land, and she came back with a good report. It was great. Uh, it wasn't illegal. Um, it was the statute of limitations is way gone, so it's fine. Uh, so Moses asks them specifically to look for certain things. And in verses 17 to 20, he says this. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev and go up into the hill country. See what the land is, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are trees in it or not. Be of good courage. Bring us some fruit of the land. And now is the season of the time of the first ripe grapes. So this land is rich. I mean, there's, there's hill country. There's all kinds of things. It's, it's full of what they need, right? And Moses is like, go tell me what's going on. Are the cities really big? Are there walls? Is it just camps? Are the people regular size? Are they giants? Who knows? I don't know why he asked that particular question, but I think we'll find out here in a minute. How's the land? Does it produce good food? Bring us some of it back. This is what you look for, right? If you're going to go possess a new country, these are the things you want to know. So they're sent out, and they go, and they find all these things. And they see great fruit on the vine. They find beautiful, large cities. They find big, healthy people, rivers, lakes, coastline, hill country, plains, mountains, forests, everything a couple million people could ask for, a veritable Disney world of new nations, right? All of the spies stay together. They don't split up. They don't go in and say, all right, now, Joshua and Caleb, you guys go over there. We're going to go over here. You go over here. You go over there. They just stay together the whole time. This pack of 12 walking through this new country all together. They all see the exact same stuff. Everyone sees the same things, experiences the same thing, and they come back to give their report. And 10 of them saw this nation from a different perspective. Verses 27 to 29 says, And they told him, talking to Moses, We came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, which is a quote from, the, the, from promises of God, that the land will be flowing with milk and honey, is, which is not literal. That would be terrible. But it's just to say, it's got everything you need. And this is its fruit. They've got this, this big, great thing that they wanted to show him. However, gosh, this however really ruins a lot of stuff. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. They got a long list of complaints, all of which, if you took the word however out of that sentence, could sound positive. Just an interesting way to think about it. And if you don't know what the sons of Anak are, I'm not going to go deep into it, but this is connected to that, that stuff called the Nephilim, which are mentioned in Genesis 6, which are, you could, you know, it depends on how you read it, depends on how you, what you think about it, but they could be descended from angels, or they could be descended from demons, or they're just really big people that they came up with a story about. Who knows? Doesn't matter. All that matters for our purposes is that they were scary. They were terrifying. If you ever heard the story of David and Goliath, Goliath is also mentioned to be a son of Anak or one of the Nephilim or whatever it is. They were terrifying. They were large, robust, scary people. And they came back with that report. It's too scary. It's too hard. There's too many people. The cities are too big. The people are too tall. Blah, 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 blah. But before we get too harsh with them, which is where typically I go in this story, before we get too harsh with them, let's remember something about these Israelites. They were slaves. They were 100% locked down slaves. And their fathers were slaves. And their grandparents were slaves. They were slaves who came from slaves. And the idea of saying to a group of a million plus slaves, here's a country just for you. Here's a country that you get to have for yourself is not an easy concept for these people to grasp. They have been told and beat into them for generations that they aren't worthy of a land of their own, that all that they're good for is to work the land for others. So the idea of being given this land is not something that would have immediately clicked for them, and so they struggle with it. It's difficult for them to understand. No matter what they've been told, no matter what they've seen God do, his mighty wonders did not equate for them the kind of trust they needed to enter this land. They are stuck in an old identity. 
They cannot fathom this idea that they have been set free. And that freedom means God takes care of me. They cannot connect with that. And so they rebel against it. It's not what they wanted. It's not what they thought they were going to get. It's difficult. You know, I'm, I'm not a very good son. If my mom were here, she'd say amen. Um, I, my sisters were great. I had a problem. Um, I was a notorious Christmas present searcher. Uh, I, it's just what I did. I knew around November um, that mom was stockpiling presents somewhere, and so it was my job to find them. That was my God-given right as the firstborn, is to find the gifts and decide if I wanted them or not. Um, so typically, I'd find good stuff, and I'd be like, all right, I, I put my stamp of approval on this. I'm going to put it back, make sure she doesn't know I found it. But if I didn't like something, I would like take it out and like leave it in the living room so that she knew, oh, he doesn't like this. I'll take it back. And uh, there was this one particular one that really built up for me a, a moment of excitement, and then I was completely let down. I was really into G.I. Joes, the little guys that you could p- play with, and I would, I'd have dozens of them. I was scaling all-out battles against each other. I, you remember I told you I was a nerd, right? Um, so I found this very poorly hidden present, probably because it was so big one day, just in the closet underneath a jacket. That She didn't put a lot of effort into this one. So I found it, and it was this big, giant box that said G.I. Joe on it. And immediately I was like, oh, my gosh, she got me like 30 G.I. Joes and put them in this box. I was so excited. That's what I thought I was going to get. And I opened it, and there was nothing in it. It was just a box to put my G.I. Joes in. I was like, I have a shoebox for that. It's fine. And my mom, in her very loving and giving nature, thought, I can do better than a shoebox. Let me get him this cool box to put his G.I. Joes in. But I was supremely disappointed. It should have been filled with G.I. Joes. It shouldn't have been something that I had to go take my G.I. Joes and put them in, and then it's just a box for my G.I. Joes. That's not what I wanted. I wanted more G.I. Joes, as any young American boy should. (laughs) That's not what I got. So I whined about it. I complained about it. I put it out in the middle of the living room, and she got very upset, and it turned into a whole thing. And it's still something that gets mentioned around Christmas time about every year. Yeah. My sisters were better. I mean, they looked for presents, and sometimes I'd find them for them and present them to them, and they'd be like, oh, that's so nice that mom got me that, even though they didn't really want it. They had a better perspective than I did. Their perspective was, wow, mom's so nice. She's giving us stuff that we don't deserve, and that's so great, which also made me want to puke because, come on, be cool. Um, Be selfish. It's more fun. Can we put that on the Instagram for the post this Sunday when Nick said, be selfish, it's more fun? That'll be what everyone remembers from my sermon. No, so they saw it from my perspective. I saw it from the selfish, this isn't what I wanted perspective. And I say all this to say that if you, if you read this story, I think the more we read it and understand it, the more I think we're going to find that we end up identifying with the Israelites in this story. As much as we want to be like, what was wrong with them? Look at everything God promised for them. If you really think about it from their perspective, it's, it's, I feel like it's easier to identify with them than to be mad at them. So we get a negative report. They don't want to go. Caleb, however, has a different opinion about it. Caleb, one of the 12 that was sent in, sees things from a different perspective. So this is what he says in verses 30 to 33. Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Everyone's complaining. Everyone's whining. This isn't right. That's too scary. It's too dangerous. Caleb gets up and says, shut it. Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report that the land they spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it of our great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. That's how we seemed to them. Caleb says, let's do this. Let's go now. And they say, I don't think you heard me. I don't think you understand. It's, it's hard. It's terrifying. And then they start to inflate the story a little bit, whereas before there are some people who are large and there are some fortified cities. Now it's 
all the people that we saw in it are of great height. Now it's the land devours its inhabitants. And now they don't say the sons of Anak word. They say the actual Nephilim, which makes it even scarier. They're inflating the problem to make it easier to say no. I, uh, I met uh, Shaq once. I met him. I shook his hand. It was terrifying. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's, it's, it's terrifying to shake the hand of a man that you know, if he really wanted to, could just rip it off. You just make sure you say nice things, right? He was big. Did I seem like a grasshopper next to him? Not really. My little sister might have, but that's not the case. He was big and he was imposing. And for all I know, he is one of the Nephilim. I don't really know. He's gargantuan, right? I met him. I saw his shoe. They had it on display in the shoe store. It was the size of like my entire arm. Is, is crazy. He was an enormous man. And if he was coming at me with the intent to destroy me, I think that I would cower like a grasshopper, right? Or just give in. Just accept the fact that there's literally nothing I can do. I don't have a sling and a rock with me, so I'm pretty much out of luck. It's so easy to see enormous problems and just decide that we can't do it. That is so simple, so easy to do. To look at a land that they say was filled with shacks and say, there's nothing we can do. I mean, it's physically impossible. And and then they say, they describe the land as a land that devours its inhabitants, which I guess is to say that anyone who goes through there, that's not one of them, will be destroyed. And I think about, there's this place, it's called Snake Island. Uh, it's, it's inhabited by these very venomous, very aggressive snakes. So much so that there's this story of this family that went to run the, the lighthouse on this island. And they were found, all of them, just dead by snake bites because apparently they broke in and found a way to get in and just destroyed this family. That's a land that devours its inhabitants, literally. There's another story that I, that I read about a lot. It's called the, the Sentinelese Island in the Adamant Islands, it's this place with this tribe of people that have not been contacted for a long time because every time someone shows up, they die. They cannot, you can't even find real. Only pictures you can find are like drone footage or helicopters that have come by and the pictures you see are of them throwing their spears at it to get rid of it. There's a story of this young guy who decided that he was being called to be a missionary in this place, and he goes, and they almost kill him, and he magically gets away. And then he decides, I'm going to go back, and of course, they kill him. He's, he's destroyed. That land devours its inhabitants. This is not that land. Twelve of these guys just spent 40 days walking through it, taking tours of the cities, grabbing fruit off the vine, and nothing happened to them. That is not a land that devours its inhabitants. They're exaggerating. They are making it seem so much worse than it actually was. We inflate our problems. Those problems we don't want to deal with, those those things that we don't want, that we know we're supposed to have, but we don't want them, we inflate the problem to something where it becomes impossible. We inflate them in our fears as well to make us feel better when we walk away rather than push through. Israelites are are actively doing this right now. They are actively forgetting the promises of God. And we do the same thing. We do the same thing. The question I asked at the beginning of the story was, what what if we believed that God's promises were true? What if we listened to God's promises rather than our preferences in our daily lives? What if we believed that God's promises for us were true and we lived into them? I look at these promises and I think about what did, what did Jesus say to us? What are some promises that Jesus has for you and for me? I'm going to read you a few of these. John 16, he says, In me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's important. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. All who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's important. 
John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Matthew 6, 31, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly Father knows you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. John 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, talking about the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. You know him. He dwells with you and will be in you. Promise on promise on promise on promise. John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's a very, very big promise. He's literally saying, believe that what I'm saying is true. Believe in me and you will live forever. That's a promise. That's not a maybe this will happen. Not a if you do these things and it all works out just according to plan and there are no problems and no awkward difficulties in the middle, it'll happen. It's saying, if you believe in me forever and ever and ever and ever, you'll be with me. That's a promise that we can cling to and brand on our hearts and say, this is how I live my life every day. I live my life every day as if I am chosen and not forsaken. I live my life every day as if God has promised me that if I lay my life down to him, he will guide me and bring me and protect me and deliver me. What if instead of the land devours its inhabitants, the people are huge, the cities are fortified, what if instead they had said the land produces large, healthy people? What a blessing! The cities are already built for us. What a blessing. Those outside of this land are already afraid of invading this place. What a blessing. How much does God love us that he would give us all of this? God will deliver on his promises. What if instead of the world is broken, it's too hard, it's too unfair, we remember that God has overcome the world and he will work all things together for my good. What if instead of being a Christian, it's so hard, it's, it's too much work, it's too much sacrifice, God is asking too much of you. What if we remember that God promises if you give your life to him, he will give you rest. He will give you rest. What if instead of, I feel like I just can't get away from sin, it has too strong a hold on me, it's too tempting, it's too, all these things. Instead of that, we remember the son who sets us free, says we are free indeed. There is no more chain holding us down. We are free and let go and released into a world that we are told to love the people in it and love God, and we will be given all that we need. What if we remember these things? What if we wake up every day and say these things to ourselves and walk out of our door knowing that we are with him? Knowing that there are promises that will guide us into success through him. What if we remember that there are promises that guide us into loving, deep relationships with people that will draw them into relationship with Christ? What if we remember that all these promises were true? What if we did that? We could look at our Nephilim and our fortified cities and all these problems that we look at and say, I can't do it. And remember with confidence that God has promised to be with us through all of it. You know, I, we dropped our kids off and picked them up from Sky Ranch this last week. And as we were going to pick them up yesterday, I, we drove past this stretch of road. And I, I worked at this summer camp when I was younger. And I was right in the middle of training for soccer. And so I ran every day. I ran three miles every day. And sometimes I would try to push it to six. And I know you can tell it's obvious, right? Um, the, the fact that you laughed at that really hurts my feelings. Um... So there was this one time I decided I was going to try and do a six-mile thing. I knew where the three-mile marker was, but the six one, someone had just told me about it, so I trusted them, and I, and I tried to do it. And uh, it must have been about the five-mile mark. I just started to look around and realize I have no idea where I am. I am lost. I am scared because it's the middle of the day. It's Texas summer. It's hot. I'm out of water. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. And so I turned around and walked back. And it took a good two hours at least in the hot Texas sun, middle of the day, to walk home, to walk back to where I knew, where I felt comfortable. And what I didn't realize as I drove there yesterday, that I was like, I don't know, 100 meters from the turn I needed to be, where I would have recognized where I was. 
or I would have just made it. But I was scared. I didn't know where I was. I was nervous. I didn't trust, I guess, the guy who told me. And so I turned around and walked back. And next week, we're going to look at the next part of the story and hear that that's what the Israelites want to do. They want to turn around and go home. They don't understand this place. It's unfamiliar to them. It's scary to them. They want to go home. If they had just trusted just a little bit more, if they had just walked a little bit in the promises of God, everything would have been different. It may seem like you've been trusting and trusting and trusting, and you're never seeing the relief that God promises. You remember this, that God's promises take time. God's promises take time. But in the meantime, if we wander with God and see where he takes you, you will find yourself living into promises that are centuries old, that were meant for them and are meant for you. What if we look past our preferences and live into the promises that God has for us? Let me pray. God, thank you for these promises. God, thank you for showing us over and over again that you love us, that you are with us, and that there is nothing we cannot accomplish with you by our side. God, give us the strength and courage to walk out of this place drenched in your promises with the confidence of a people who are chosen by you. God, we love you and we need you. Be with us as we worship this morning. In your name, amen.